Welcome to Infernal Dominion on Brutal Existence Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the legend from Master, Mr. Paul Speckman. Hey Paul, <laughs> it's an honor to do this interview with a living legend like you. How is it going these days with you and the band? Uh, things are going well. Uh, we just released uh, a new CD yeah. called, uh, called The uh, Human Machine. Right. Uh, just this past April. Yeah. And uh, we've really been doing lots of concerts and uh, lots of touring lately for the new album. Uh, people seem to like it. Uh, you know, I'm busy and I, I hope it works, you know. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. And uh, it's quite overwhelming to see that the massive tank called as Master is still polarizing the masses, even after 27 years of non-stop frenzy. And there's just nothing which, is, which can stop you. A perfect example would be the latest album, which about uh, you just told. And uh, this album garnered a favorable response amongst fans and critics alike and became yet another feather in your cap. So now I would like you to shed some light on the songwriting and the recording processes of the album. Okay, no problem. It, it, it was no different from any album. Uh, usually when uh, it's time to uh, record an album, I pull out my uh, micro cassette recorder and go through the... Uh, you know, ten or twenty hours of uh, of uh, guitar uh, recordings okay. that, I, that that I, that I usually put on the micro cassette recorder in the backyard of my house, and okay, and uh, you know, I'll listen to it over a few days, and then I'll just try and pick out uh, decent riffs, you know, and and I try and put songs together. Right, that sounds good. And uh, after being marred with a lot of lineup changes since Master's entire career. You finally have a stable lineup with the last four records, and it has been certainly very crucial in maintaining Master's credibility and brutality. So, how do you feel about Alex and Denek after being together and creating Sickness since a good amount of time now? That's great with these guys. You know, it's uh, we've been together since 2004, and what was yeah. quite inter what was quite interesting is when I got together with the guys, neither of them spoke any English whatsoever. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in, on that first record, that uh, the Spirit of the West, for example. Right. Uh, like the first two uh, two rehearsals, I had to bring my girlfriend at that time, who's not my wife, but anyway, I had okay. to bring her with me with me to interpret and practice the first two times, and and then after that, everything was fine. It's just like uh, we let the music do the talking, you know. Exactly. You know, I I would uh, just play the guitar parts for the guitar player, show him what I want hand it to him, he would play it, I'd pick up the bass, right. start practicing, we'd start practicing, that's how we did the first record together. Okay. Now, obviously, obviously, since this time, uh, the guitar player speaks a little bit of English, the drummer, you know, then all he speaks really, really well now English, so it makes things easier. But, but as you said, it, it's great to have a stable lineup, and it's, you know, four, like you said, four records later, I'm happy about it. Yeah, it's it's uh, much easier to work with the same people because you, uh, you you have it's the same mentality, you know. Right. And what's really good about having these guys—they're both younger than I am. Yeah. And so they bring they bring uh, new ideas and concepts, you know, into the songs. Right. You know, it's like uh, they're from a younger generation, so they have have a different way of thinking. You know. Exactly. It's it's, it's like I'm only thinking old school when I'm. Uh, when I'm uh, recording and, and, and writing songs and, you know, they're listening to different kinds of music and stuff. And, and for me, it, it, it obviously makes the, the master records more interesting and stronger these days. It's not just one, one uh, style anymore. It's a mixture of stuff, you know? Yes, I agree with that fact. Good to hear about that. Then um, the prominence of bass guitar and death metal would have never have been the same without your vital contributions. The heavy and ballsy bass lines have not been only a formidable part of your musical spectrum, but it has also paved way for many younger musicians taking up the instrument more seriously in extreme metal music. So tell me that how did you actually fall in love with this instrument, and uh, who were your primal influences? Oh well, you know, I actually began uh, singing in a in a, a band the first time around way back in uh, high school, which is you know many years ago. Yeah, and uh, and I'd always dreamed of playing bass, and I finally got my hands on a bass, and and then I was practicing, sitting at home for like seven hours a day, and 
not going to school, not going to school, getting a lot of trouble with my parents and stuff, and you know, <laughs> totally uh, breaking away from the norm and doing my thing. Yeah. And uh, and what really got me going was, uh, for example, the first record I discovered in my older brother's collection was Black Sabbath. It was uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Oh, uh, that's a great record. And this, yeah, and this was a big influence on me. And uh, obviously, during that time, I I discovered uh, shortly afterwards Judas Priest and and uh, Motorhead, you know, yeah. and obviously Iron Maiden. You yeah. know, I, for for example, I saw Steve Harris, uh, you know, on the on the uh, on the Killers tour and also on the Number of the Beast tours. You know, the original tours. Nice. And obviously, Steve Harris was a big influence on my playing as well. The thing is, is that like during the in the early years, I was like when I first started playing bass, I was more into into uh, technical speed and all kinds of fancy grooves and stuff and okay and once uh death strike and master formed i was more into playing just simple straight and heavier i actually i really changed my style i you know i would say that when i was uh younger and stuff i was a much better bass player than i am today but okay. doesn't matter point is is i put my my energy into the bass and uh for me the bass is an important instrument you know Exactly. It's like, it's, it's like many bands uh, have no bass on their records at all. I agree with that fact. You know, and, you know, and after hearing bands like Black Sabbath, like I said to you, and Judas Priest, there's always bass on these bass. records. Yeah, right. right. And it's very important. And, I, and, and, and Iron Maiden as well, of course. You listen to the early records. Of, I mean, even today, the bass is prevalent on their records, but it was right. he heavier back in the early days. And I, and I like this, you know. I, I think the bass is an important instrument. It's my favorite instrument, obviously. And uh, every master record or every every record you've ever heard that I recorded, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hear the bass because oh, of course I do. It's it's too too many bands today where they you know where the bass is hidden. You know, it's it all sounds the same today in yes. recording. You know, if you li you listen to the Human Machine record or Slaves to Society, yeah, these are still still got an old school feel. Yes. With a little bit more modern approach, let's say, to the recording, but at the same time, the guitar, the bass, the drums are still heavy yeah. and still it's still natural sounding, you know. Right, I agree. Um, good to know that because even I agree with the fact that a lot of new extreme metal records, or say metal records, they are just uh, shying away from including the bass parts. But I feel that it's very, very important to have a good bass line in order to make the record sound more brutal. Well, you know, I even had trouble, like, for example, when I was recording with Scott Burns at Morris Sound, Yeah. you know, way back in uh, the early 90s, we recorded that on the seventh day God created Master. Yeah. And and I remember the we did the first mixes together when I was there in the studio with him, and we went out to his car and, and uh, listened to it. I thought it sounded pretty good. And that was the first thing he said to me, oh, man, there's too much bass in here. <laughs> <laughs> so we went back in and we remixed it and stuff. Yeah. And, uh... And then, uh, and, and you know, he lowered the bass a bit, and I was like, oh, well, we may need a little more bass. And then we ran out of time, and he went on to finish mixing the record and mm -hmm. triggering the drums without me. And so I never heard the final recordings until they were finished, and there was little or no bass on the record. Uh, okay, it was it, it, this was one of my best-selling records, I admit that. It's a great record, don't yes, get me wrong. Yes, of course it is. But... There's no bass on the record, and it just totally takes away from the the whole idea yeah. of Master. You know, if you listen to early Master, the first record, you hear the bass as well. It's Amazing. very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my personal favorite would be the bass solo, which comes ahead of uh, Children of the Grave. That's really an amazing one. Oh, you, you know, that's funny you mentioned that, because so many people have just said that bass solo sucks. Uh, original, I don't agree with that fact. The, the, the original drummer hated it, you know. I, you know, we had an argument about if we're going to put it on the record or not, and I told him we are. I paid for the record. We're putting it on, blah, blah, blah. And over the years, a lot of people have criticized it. But then, like, let's say in the last four or five years, mm -hmm. a lot of people have been writing me and saying that it's a very innovative, interesting interlude, you know. And, and uh, of course, I wrote it from my heart. It wasn't meant to be a technical blah, 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 quote, yeah. unquote, you know, unbelievable bass. So this was more of a feeling. And, and you know, and that's the same on every master record. Master records are filled are filled with feeling. You know, it's not yes. supposed to be the fastest, unbelievable, crappy, unintelligible song every time. For me, if you don't understand what's going on in the music, it's a waste of time. 
I agree with that. You know? Yeah. It's just my opinion, of course, you know, but... I have to believe with your opinion, but I don't know about the other people. Yeah, anyway, yeah, they'll, let's they'll probably be upset do. about it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't care, yeah. Sometimes the truth hurts, yeah? Yes, it is. Then, um, obviously, the greatest thing about Master is that how splendidly the band has maintained its credibility and trademark sound, even after almost three decades of existence. Well, it's absolutely amazing to think about it, since many bands which began in the early days faltered after a demo or a few records. But the carnage called Master still rages on. So what gives you the drive to rage on this battle and destroy everything in your path? Uh, well, the world today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like uh, the world is, is, uh, is in such turmoil today. and yeah. So much chaos going on and so many people are getting killed and being wiped out and people are dying of disease everywhere. And, right. And, and this... Uh, for me, uh, this this is uh, uh, great for songwriting. You know, it's like I, I write songs about what's going on today, how I feel, and just my opinions. Okay, they may not be the right opinion for everybody, but I like to uh, bring out my uh, thoughts and ideas in my songs. Yeah. And uh, obviously, life is difficult, and there's much aggression going on, like I said, in the world. And I like to just share the aggression that comes from me in the music. Yes. For me, it's, for me, it's better to to beat up the bass guitar and scream like a banshee from hell than, than beating up the neighborhood and going to jail. You know, <laughs> you know, I want to remain a free man. And for me, the the best way to take out my aggressions toward uh, what's happening in the world today is through my music. Yeah, I agree with that fact. Even in countries like ours, India and the whole subcontinent, we have a lot of problems with the society, the whole system. And I guess that is was one reason why I got into this metal music and into the more darker sounds. And, and today, I'm like totally devoted to it and dedicated to it. And it's all because of people like you who are just giving us a drive to, you know, just trust on the thing and just bash our heads off and just do it. So thanks a lot. For like I said, you know, you know, like I like I I always say that to people is that you know it's like you know, the the military could learn something from the musicians, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. We're in there headbanging and screaming our heads off. Or we're not killing each other, man. We're having a good time there. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I get the point. Okay. Yeah. And uh, being a 20 years old dude, I actually miss the olden days and really wish to go back to the time and witness that golden era. The whole feeling must have been so charismatic, and I'm sure that this new era cannot ever come closer to that period. So uh, what do you think about those olden times when Paul Speckman and Master were just stepping on the American middle horizons? And uh, please share some of the most memorable experiences too. Uh, well, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, it, it's not all that it's cracked up to be because back in the early days when Master just started playing, yeah, people were people. It was small amount of people coming to the shows. Okay, you know, you were lucky to get fifty people to come and see a Master or an Abomination show, for instance. Yeah, it's like uh, it, it wasn't really that. But the scene really wasn't so big in the early days. Okay. And, and it's like uh, I did a lot of tours back in the early days, and again, there were no people across America. I, for, to be quite honest with you, I had to move to Europe to get respect. It's a strange yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. Once I, well, ever since I moved to Europe ten years ago, I've been playing more concerts and festivals than I right. ever did in my in my career, you know. Yeah. So, Interesting. And, you know, <laughs> memorable experiences. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know. The last 10 years have been the most memorable years of my life, to be quite honest with you. Okay. Sorry You're... to say that. You know, I mean, I realize that the, I guess the USA scene has picked up in the last few years. I, yeah, I it has. There, yeah, I toured there in uh, 2008 and 2009. And actually, we had some successful shows, you know. Yeah. There wasn't just 20 people or 50 people. There, you know, there was over 100 every time and sometimes 300. So it has improved for me. But back in the day... You know, other bands got respect, and Master, one of the innovators of the style, was was just left in the underground, where we still are today. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I really wish to see Master playing in India someday, and we all would be just glad to see you guys there, and just we'll headbang our asses off. Yeah, I, I, I hope we get a chance to come there one day. Actually. Sure, why not? Uh, uh, we'll try our asses off to that. Yeah. That's a dream for me, huh? Mm, yeah. And uh, talking about Master's music, uh, your music are just totally firmly rooted in the original heavy, 
thrash and the hardcore scenes and a mixture of those is what makes the sound so ballsy and raw. So what were some of the earliest